I decided to do a series of videos on progressive web apps, PWAs, specifically in Blazor. And in this first video, we're just going to look at the idea of what a PWA is and how we can create one out of the box using Visual Studio. Now, a PWA is something that you can have in all sorts of different front-end technologies. So you can have it in Angular, in React, but Blazor is obviously what we're going to look at. And a PWA is typically defined by a number of terms that we can see in this diagram here. It's discoverable, available, usable, responsive, fresh, secure, and installable. And we'll look at those various aspects over this series of videos. The key ones that we need to look at at the moment are the fact that it's installable, that we can install it onto a desktop or onto a mobile device or something like that. And also that it's available, that's to say it's going to work offline if you've got a bad connection or something like that. So the idea of a PWA is once you've installed it, it looks to all intents and purposes like an actual native application, but it's not really, it's still a web application. It runs in a browser, but not in the normal browser, in a dedicated browser window that strips away all the things like the back and the forward button and the address bar and that sort of thing you have in the browser. So let's take a look at how we can put one of these things together. So let's go into Visual Studio, create a new project, and we're going to create a Blazor WebAssembly project. So because this has got to work offline, clearly Blazor server isn't appropriate. It's going to be Blazor WebAssembly. So we'll start one of those. And then we'll just call this basic PWA demo, put it in the right location. And then the important thing to notice is we want to have this checkbox for progressive web application check. So normally it's not, but I've obviously been using this before. So that's what we want to do. And that will put in the extra features that will make this work. We can retrofit this to an existing Blazor WebAssembly application, but it's much easier just to have it like this out of the box. And so we click create on that and that will create our application. And then if we run that up, we'll see that we've just got the basic out of the box Blazor application. So if I drag it over, you can see we've got the home and we've got the counter and we've got the weather, the normal sort of thing. So nothing new there. But the extra thing that we do have is here, we've got this little button in the address bar in the Chrome browser, install basic PWA demo. And that is what will allow us to install this on the desktop or the equivalent, we would install it on a mobile device or something like that. And so that's indicating that we have got a PWA. So what are the differences we've got there? Well, if we look in www root, we'll see a couple of things have been added. The first thing that we've got added is this manifest.web manifest. And that contains the information that's required to do that installation onto your device. So it's got things like the name and the short name, which both default to being the same. We've got some colors that are going to be used when it's installed. And we've also got some icons that are going to be used so when we've got a button to launch this, that's what we have there. And again, if we run that up and then bring up DevTools and go to Application on here, then we can see that right at the top there, we've got this manifest and that is basically showing us the contents of that manifest file. So it's telling us we could have a bit more information in there, but it's giving us that information. And you can see there it's got those icons that were defined, just use the Blazor icon to start with, but obviously we could replace those with our own icon for application to make it something distinctive. All of that we'll be looking at in later videos. But that's basically enough information for it to be able to have that install button. So that dealt with the installable that we had in the diagram. The other thing we're worried about immediately though is the idea of it being available so that it will work offline. And that is done by this second file this service worker.js. And basically that file is, if we look in the index, we can see there is where that manifest is being specified so the browser can look at it as a link. And then down here, we've got this navigator.serviceworker.register and then my service worker file. So that's where it's going to be registered. And it's not like an ordinary JavaScript file that you just include in the application, like the one we've got above, say, this is specifically registered, so it will remain resident in the browser and will sit in the background. And basically, its job is to intercept any calls that are made from the browser back to the server. And once it's intercepted them, it can do all sorts of clever things. Most importantly, it can cache 
the results of earlier requests and therefore have them available locally. And so if you find yourself in a situation where you're not connected to the backend server because you haven't got a network or something like that, then it can use the cached version rather than using the actual data coming back and therefore you're available offline. There may be some limitations in that, but at least you can do something with the offline data. Now, if we take a look at that, you'll actually see there's a couple of these. There's a service worker and a service worker published. And if we look at the service worker, we'll see that it doesn't do very much at all. Basically, whenever it receives a fetch request, so that's the underlying fetch API that makes our requests from the browser, it simply forwards that directly to the backend server. So just a neutral one that we've got there. And then we've got this service worker published, and that's where we're starting to do that sort of work that we're talking about. The reason that we have the two of these is because when you're doing development on your desktop, you probably don't want actually to have this caching and so forth happening because it's really going to spoil things if you're trying to check whether it's connecting to your back end and that sort of thing. So normally we just run it with this service worker that does nothing at all. But when we publish, that service worker will basically get replaced with the service worker dot published and then it'll start working properly. That said, we want to be able to actually have this working for development. So what I'm going to do is go into the service worker and comment out that basic behavior and then grab all of the stuff that we've got in the published version and paste that in here. So now we're going to be running as if it were published. Sometimes you want to do that, sometimes you won't, but you can do it in this sort of way. And if we just take a look at what's happening in there, then we can see that we have a few things in there. We'll look at a lot more detail of this in later videos, but basically you've got this on install, you've got this on activate, and then the most important one, you've got this on fetch, and you can see what it does. It looks to see if this is a get request, so it's not going to do anything special for posts and puts and that sort of thing. But then if it is, it takes a look in the cache. So we've got a cache name that it's set up, which is just using the prefix and that sort of thing, the offline cache that we've got there. But it looks in the cache, which is cached in the browser, and if it can find something in the cache matching this request, then it uses that cached response. Otherwise, it does an actual fetch and will go to the backend server. And so we'll see all of that working. So we've copied that into our actual service worker. One thing you've got to remember to do when you do that is you're going to need to do a complete rebuild, not just a build, so that it knows to move things around and we'll see exactly what's going on in a moment there. So we'll rebuild that. And now when we run that up, if we again go to DevTools and have a look at application and we can see here in service workers, we've got the information about those service workers. And so you can see at the moment, if you look at that source, if we click on that, we can see that that is the old one. And the reason for that is service workers don't automatically update straight away when you write a new one. The reason being that on a client machine, when this is deployed, you might have several applications working on the same service worker, and so it doesn't update until all of them are ready for that. And you can see what's happened. We've got number zero is activated and running. That was the old one. And then number one, which is the one I just replaced it with, is actually waiting to activate. So that would have to wait for the appropriate opportunity. But within DevTools, very nice, we've got lots of features so we can do something like, for example, skip waiting. So if I click skip waiting, then it moves through and we've now got number one up and running. And if I click on that, then you can see that we've got that full version that we copied in there. And other things we can do, we can actually demonstrate that that's working because purely for development and test purposes, you can see we've got the ability to go offline. And if I click offline, you can see the network is now giving us a warning that it's offline. But if I start navigating around in here, say go to counter, that's still working. Go to weather, that's still working. And you can see that we've got everything working okay. And that's because it's all gone into the cache. So what we've now got is if we look in cache storage, we've got that offline cache followed by a unique identifier. Remember that offline cache was what we'd set up there and where we're looking for all that information. And that's where it can get the data from. And if we go back and look in here, you can see in the offline cache, there we can see 
all of the things that have been cached. Now, where did that happen? Because in that fetch, we weren't actually looking for that. So where's that all coming from? Well, what happens is, if we just go and look at the sources, you can see that now, as well as this service worker, what was generated when we did the build was also this thing called service worker assets. And so what we can see here is a load of assets. And what the build process has done, basically, is looked at everything inside www root, basically, all the static assets that need to be downloaded. So all of our CSS, our sample data for the weather forecast, and other things as well. And basically, put all that together, generated this file automatically, and that's what we've got in there. So basically the URL for everything that's going to need, plus also some things to do with Blazor itself that are going in there, like we can see lots of WebAssembly files and other things like that. And really don't need to worry too much about the detail of that, but it's put those, all those together. And then if we look in the service worker, then you can see that as part of the install, it gets hold of all those assets and basically adds them straight into the cache on startup. So that's why we have all of those things in the cache that we saw here. Those have all been put in as static. And that's why the whole thing is working, even though we set this to offline, as we can see there. And obviously, one of the issues with that is it means that you've now got stale data. It doesn't matter so much for just things that we've got as WebAssembly, but we do have to watch out that stale data. And so that's why, in a more advanced approach, we might be putting something different in that service worker file so that it times out or something like that. Can show the sort of thing to make it fail. If we go to the cache once again, and if I just do a search for, say, weather, just put this back on the side, then we can see there is our weather.json, which has just been given us there. And if we delete that, now what we'll see is although the counter page works fine and the home page works fine, if we go to the weather page, that now gives us an error. And if we look at the console, we can see that the fetch failed. So remember what's happening there. We were looking in the cache. Again, let's look down here. So we looked in the cache, but I've just removed it from the cache. Then it tried to do a real request. And that's what failed because, remember, we had turned off the network. So if we just take a look at the network that we've got there, we can see those failures happening when it tries to get hold of things. Whereas if we turn the network back on and navigate back to the weather, then this time we've got the data and we can see now that we got a valid fetch happening. Finally, though, now that we've got the service worker and all that sort of thing working, let's do the final important bit, which is to install it. So let's click on that button there, and it just gives us a warning. We're going to click Install, and then just click Yes on that, and then just drag this over. And now you can see that we've got that exact same application, but now it doesn't look like it's running in a browser, it looks like a standalone application. If I close that down, you can see that because I asked it to, it's put it on the toolbar. So if I click that, it'll just run that back up and we're back in there with that application working as it did before. And we can actually see it's still a browser. If you hit F12, we will still get the dev tools up there so we can start looking at all that sort of thing and we can see that everything is still there in the same sort of way. But from a user's point of view, it looks much more like an application now, but it will also still run offline. So if we, again, bring that up and switch that to offline mode, then we can still see that we can go around there and we can make it all work in the correct way. So that's the basics that we have of a Blazor PWA. We've seen you have the manifest file, you have the service worker. Lots more we can do with the service worker. That's a lot of what we're looking at in future videos. But then once you've got both of those, then you can install it and it looks pretty much like any other application. Obviously, it's not quite like a true native application that doesn't have full access to the operating system. It can only do what you can do through a browser, which is actually in many senses a benefit because it means people will trust it much more because it's not an actual native application. So I hope that was helpful as an introduction to PWAs and Blazor. Over the next few videos, we'll be seeing far more features and putting together a full-blown application. So if you enjoyed that, do click like, do subscribe, and I'll see you next time.